Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm so honored. I didn't know Ted O'Neill was going to be here or that he was going to introduce me. And I look up to this man so much. You've just heard from somebody who has an amazing perspective on all of this and, and all the best values. And Ted, thank you for your help when I was doing the book and just for, for being an example um, of the way we should do things and the way we should talk about things. Um, he said that I'm going to make you happy tonight. Um, that's a pretty tall order. I don't know that I'm going to make you totally happy. I think I'm going to give you some things that are worth holding on to, I hope so. Um, but I'm going to begin maybe on a sadder note. Um, I've been privileged enough to come into some environments like this, to high schools, over the last couple of weeks and to talk um, to audiences that have included students. And I'm especially happy when students are there. Um, I did it about two weeks ago um, in the suburban Long Island High School. Um, that's where Matt Levin, who was mentioned earlier tonight, went to school and his parents, who wrote a letter that was in an excerpt in the Times that you may have seen and that every time I look at it still brings me to tears. Um, I was there that night until about 9.15. Um, and it, and uh, luckily I was in bed by 1.15, but that was the timestamp, 1.15 a.m. on an email that I, that I got the next morning that I found in my inbox. So this was something somebody was up until 1.15 in the morning thinking about. Um, and I want to start by reading you that email, which I think I can do without my glasses, but I may have to put them on midway. This email said, I am the high school senior who spoke during your Q&A session. The past years of my life have been a storm of college information, from the SAT prep to the college counselors to the never-ending questions of where are you going to college. I've been exceptionally academically inclined since day one, so I fortunately received less pressure from my parents and teachers than did my peers. After relatively limited SAT prep, I earned a nearly perfect score and quit the testing mania during the fall of my junior year. I maintained a 4.0 GPA without prodding and without hair tearing. I am also a nationally accomplished equestrian. This kind of overachievement probably sounds familiar, right? And needless to say, my extracurriculars were all on a par with the rest of my application. I thought I had an Ivy League acceptance in the bag, as did my counselors and my parents. This past December, I was deferred from my first choice, Yale. Devastated, though not wholly surprised, I brushed myself off and applied to a host of other schools, a few safeties, a few lower targets, and a few reaches. I tried not to go crazy and send out upwards of 20 applications, as I saw many of my peers do. I sat anxiously from January until the first week of March to receive notices from my colleges. I finally heard from a school. I was accepted into Boston College's Honors College, and I was elated. I thought I had the rest of my safeties in the bag and several of the target schools. Over the next week, I would find out how wrong I was. I was placed on wait lists at four of my target schools and rejected from my two safeties. I was floored. Who am I if not the perfect student that I've been trying so hard to be for these last 17 years? What will the rest of my life consist of if I do not attend one of these elite universities? The questions that zipped through my head were exactly those of all other hysterical applicants. Tonight is my final night of waiting. Tomorrow I will hear back from Yale, as well as the three other Ivy League schools to which I applied. And no matter the outcome, I will try to resist letting the rejection define me. I worry for future generations. I know firsthand the anxiety the modern college application system creates, and it is only worsening with time. Most of my peers applied to between 13 and 20 schools. This number will only grow through the years as the hysteria rises, and as applications rise, elite college acceptance rates will drop and drop, causing yet more anxiety and more students applying to more schools. We are spending less and less time focusing on students' innate passions and talents, and more time on pigeonholing them into the talents that colleges deem desirable. The system is broken. That's from a 17-year-old. 
And she's right, the system is broken. Um, and I know that not just from her letter, but I know it from things I've learned over recent years and in the course of doing this book. I know it from what a professor at an Ivy League school that he did not want me to name told me about a visit he received uh, not so long ago from some relatives and their daughter. They came to him for the obvious reason of wanting to impress him with the charms and talents of their daughter so that he would maybe pick up the phone after they left and call the admissions office and say, I just met the most fabulous girl. We've got to have her here. Or maybe tap out an email. And so as they sat there with him, they went through everything. Um, they had her tell him about her SAT scores and how fabulous those were. They had him tell, they had her tell him about her perfect GPA, like, like the letter writers. Um, they talked about her extracurriculars. And he said as they were going through all of this, he could see a sort of panic set in, like had they found enough? Had they impressed him enough? And then he said at the last minute, as if they were kind of looking through the treasure chest of her charms and seeing if there was one more bauble to retrieve, the mother turned to the daughter and said, don't forget to tell him how you're the president of your high school's survivors of bulimia society. I know the system is broken because of what another professor, and this one will let me name his school, Cornell, told me. He teaches psychology there, and every year he teaches a lecture class of 200 students. Um, these are mostly juniors and seniors with a few sophomores, so all of them are several years beyond the college application process. It's not something they just went through. And he looks out at these 200 students every year, and just for his own curiosity, he asks them, will everybody who's upset they're not at Harvard or Yale, please raise their hands. And he said every year, 60%, 6-0, raise their hands. They're at Cornell University, they're several years beyond the admissions juncture, and they're still haunted by the fact that they didn't do better in the college lottery. I know the system is broken because of what I myself saw at Princeton University where I was teaching a course, a writing seminar, during this time last year. Um, I was lucky in that my course was oversubscribed. It was a food writing course, so it looked fun and popular. I had 48 applicants for 16 slots, and what the school does in a situation like that is they ask all the applicants to write a letter, you know, showing their writing, introducing themselves, talking about why they want to take the class, and then they let the professor in this case me, choose his or her students. So I opened up the 48 letters, I read them, they were charming, they were wonderful, I thought this is gonna be amazing, I chose my 16 students. About halfway through the semester, it dawned on me that most of the kids in the class had never written anything for me in the class that had the charm, the verve, or the polish of those letters. And I thought I was probably wrong, so I went back to my laptop, I opened up the file, I read the letters again of the students who were in the class, and it confirmed my suspicion. So I became sort of obsessed with this, and as I went around the campus meeting more and more faculty members, I would say to each of the faculty members I met, isn't this the strangest thing? And I would relate to them what I've just related to you. To a person, each of them said, that doesn't surprise me in the least. And I said, why doesn't that surprise you? And they said, these kids are at Princeton because they're good at getting into things and because they've received the message that getting in is the point. They looked at the course offerings, they saw the title of your course, they saw the professor, they figured this is gonna be a competition, and they rallied their best energy and their best selves to get in. And once they had, that was it. That was the accomplishment. The rest was just smooth sailing or coasting. All of those stories reflect a belief that selective schools mean everything, that getting into selective schools is something that's gonna just determine the trajectory of the rest of your lives, guaranteeing success and happiness, and that the more selective the school, the better your chances of getting where you wanna go. Why do we all believe that? We believe it because it's the story we tell ourselves, it's the stories we tell each other, and we're constantly editing and distorting reality down into that narrative, which I would submit to you is a myth. And I wanna plead guilty right now and here as a member of the media and talk about what we do because I think it's an example of what happens even beyond the media. So right now, we are on the cusp of, or maybe even more than on the cusp of, the next presidential election. And the various would-be contenders are stepping forward and the media, television, newspapers, the New York Times, we're introducing you to these people, we're writing about them, we're covering them. 
If you leave here tonight and you go home and you Google Ted Cruz, if that's your thing and you want to Google Ted Cruz, um, and you download 10 profiles of Ted Cruz that are of a certain length, I guarantee you that nine or 10 of them are going to tell you in the course of that profile and probably near the beginning of that profile that he went to Princeton and then he went to Harvard for law school. If you do the same thing with Bobby Jindal, the governor of Louisiana, I guarantee you nine, if not 10, of the stories about him, if these are long profiles, are going to tell you that he was a student at Brown University and then a Rhodes Scholar. But if you do the same thing for Marco Rubio, I would be surprised if four or five of those stories, or even three, tell you that he went to the University of Florida for undergraduate and the University of Miami for law school. If you read about Jeb Bush, well, let me back up. When we wrote about George W. Bush, and I can speak from experience here, I covered his initial cam presidential campaign for the New York Times. When we wrote about him, we constantly mentioned that he went to Yale undergrad and that he got his MBA from Harvard. Jeb Bush is now running for the presidency. He's the supposedly bra brainy one in the Klan. You almost never hear that he went to the University of Texas. If you read about Chris Christie, you have to read deep into the stories or read a lot of stories to find out that he went to the University of Delaware as an undergrad and then to Seton Hall Law School. The reason for this discrepancy is it is assumed that the, that Ivy League pedigree explains the success of those people who have it, whereas that non-Ivy League pedigree is sort of incidental to the success of the people who didn't go to the Ivy League. It's sort of like hard to explain, it's irrelevant, when why isn't it maybe just as much of an explanation for where they ended up in life and for the heights they scaled as the name of a more famous school? More, more media distortion. You will read all the time that all nine justices on the Supreme Court cycled through the Ivy League. You won't read that fewer than a third of US senators went, got their undergraduate diplomas from uh, schools that were particularly elite and selective. You won't read that about a quarter or slightly under of governors have undergraduate degrees from selective institutions. When I was researching my book, I kept looking for these sample sets. Um, I looked, for example, at the Fortune 500. Um, I, did, I had limited time, so I limited it to the top 100 companies in the Fortune 500, and I listed their CEOs for myself and I looked at where those CEOs had gone to college. Fewer than a third of them had gone to particularly selective schools or particularly vaunted state universities. In the top 10, the CEOs of the top 10 Fortune 500 companies, I only found one degree undergraduate from the Ivy League or from any school like the Ivy League. That was from Dartmouth. Other than that, it was all state universities and schools that quite frankly you may never have heard of. I assume many people have heard of a MacArthur Grant. Do people know what a MacArthur Grant is? So that's known as the Genius Grant. This is one of the greatest honors you can bestow on a scientist or a scholar, you know, a poet, an artist. Um, it comes with $625,000 now, paid out over five years. I was curious, so I looked up the last couple years of MacArthur Grant winners. And sure enough, I saw some of the schools that make people's knees go weak, make their heart go pitter-patter. I also saw these schools. And by the way, there's only two dozen winners um, every year. So I'm just looking at a sample set of 48 people and all these schools and more like them were there. State University of New York at Purchase, State University of New York at Albany, Louisiana State, University of Kansas, University of Cincinnati, Columbus State University, University of Maryland, University of Illinois, where we are right here. And there were more just like that. Um, the Chronicle of Higher Education did something interesting in 2013, and it looked at a recent year of Fulbright winners. That's another scholarship you've probably heard of, the Fulbright. And it looked at which schools had produced the most number of Fulbright winners. In that list of top 10 were these schools. Arizona State University at number three, Rutgers at number five, the University of Texas at number seven. Arizona State, Rutgers, and the University of Texas all produced more Fulbrights in that period than Yale, Columbia, Duke, or Stanford. Stanford tied with Ohio State University even though more Stanford students applied for Fulbrights than did Ohio State students. 
I looked closer to home. I looked at the Times. I looked at my fellow op-ed columnists, and I'd never looked at them in this way before. So yeah, there's Ivy there. Nick Kristoff went to Harvard. David Brooks went to University of Chicago, which is Ivy Ilk. Uh, but my close friend and colleague Maureen Dowd went to Catholic University. Gail Collins, another close friend at the time, she went to Marquette. Charles Blow went to Grambling State. Joe Nocera went to Boston University. And Tom Friedman, in all his wisdom, began his undergraduate career at the University of Minnesota. I looked at recent Pulitzer winners at the Times to see if I saw any preponderance of ivy there. And sure enough, the ivies had no stranglehold on those of my colleagues who'd gone on to journalism's highest achievement. One of them is my friend David Koshinevsky. He won in a recent year in the category of explanatory reporting. Um, and in the book, I write this about him. In the spring of 2014, David and I each taught a seminar as visiting faculty members at Princeton. He reveled in the irony of that. About three decades earlier, Princeton had rejected him. So had Harvard. So had Brown. The State University of New York at Binghamton, also known as SUNY Binghamton, was one of his fallbacks. And he told me that because its students fancied themselves freer spirits than most, quote, they used to call themselves the Brown of public universities. Though I've never heard anyone at Brown call it the SUNY Binghamton of the Ivies. <laughs> David told me that even with the in-state tuition break that he got there, he had to work his way through school. And for the first two years, he put in 15 hours a week as a janitor. It was one of many unglamorous gigs over the years, including a stint in his early 20s as the driver of a Mr. Softy ice cream truck in Buffalo. Ah, David said to me, the summer of Softy. It's the worst job ever. You work every sunny day. You're off when it rains. And you have no idea how many impotence jokes there are until you've driven a Mr. Softy truck. I read that for obvious reasons, but also David's a transition into an important study I want to mention and an important point I, make, I want to make. So remember, David applied to Ivies, but was rejected from them. Went on to work at the New York Times and to win a Pulitzer Prize. So keep him in mind when I describe the following study to you. Um, in 2011, a Princeton economist named Alan Kruger and a colleague of his named Stacy Dale decided they wanted to try to get a hold on whether a person's lifetime earnings uh, would be profound affected by whether they'd gone to an elite selective school or not. And so they surveyed a broad population of the graduates of the class of 1976 and the graduates of the class of 1989. Um, and they put the graduates of selective universities in one box, so to speak, and the others in another box. And initially they determined that, wow, the people who had gone to the most elite selective schools on average earned 7% more over their lives to that point than the people who hadn't. And then they did something really, really clever and fascinating. They took that box of the non-elite people and they said, let's look at the subset of them who applied to these schools over here, but either didn't go for financial reasons or in even more cases were rejected. And let's see how their earnings compare to the elite earnings. The 7% difference entirely disappeared. And what they concluded from that which is something we should all keep in mind, is that it wasn't the elite school that made the success. It was the kind of person who had an elite school in his or her vocabulary, who thought it was the kind of thing they might reach for, and who had the sort of confidence and background to kind of put it into play, even if it hadn't ended up being the place they went. To that end, they discovered that the average SAT scores at, a school that at the schools that rejected someone were more, were a better predictor of their future earnings than the average SAT scores of the school they actually attended. In 2014, Gallup did an enormous poll of business leaders, and they asked them, they were trying to determine what, what did they most want in job applicants? What did they look at most seriously and value most dearly? And they gave them a bunch of things they could rate, um, one of which was um, field-relevant knowledge and skills, which is really another way of saying work history. Um, another of the things they gave them to rate was where the applicant had gone to college. And they could rate these things as very important, somewhat important, et cetera. 
85% of the business leaders rated field relevant knowledge slash work history. 85% of them rated that very important. The percentage of them who rated as very important where a person had gone to college, 9%. 85% to 9%. As I was doing my book, I was talking a lot because he's a good friend of mine with a gentleman named Bradley Tusk. As it happens, he was once a deputy governor of Illinois. Um, I met him through politics because he used to be the spokesman for New York Senator Chuck Schumer. Um, he went on uh, to uh, be a senior VP at, at Lehman Brothers, so he's worked in investment banking, and he managed Mike Bloomberg's third and final campaign. For, for, the, for the mayor mayoralty of New York. Bradley now runs a large strategy firm that does corporate and political strategy, and so he does a lot of hiring. And we were talking about the book as I was doing it. At one point, he, he sent me an email and said, you know, I just realized something. Right now, I have three job offers out. These job offers are for senior positions, and they're all out to people in their mid to late 30s, and I don't know where a single one of those applicants went to college. I've never asked, and I've never bothered to look. If a selective college isn't make or break, and isn't the be all and end all, and I don't think it is, then I think we have to ask ourselves some really serious questions about the values we're communicating and perhaps inculcating in a generation by portraying those colleges that way and by doing anything and everything to get into them. Um, I was really happy to hear Ted say what he did about parents because I do think parents operate from the best motives and they're just trying to make sure their kids have every opportunity and it's a brutally competitive world and everybody wants to give their offspring any and every leg up that's possible. But I think <laughs> but I think it's worth asking what you do in the course of that and whether it's really, really what you mean to be doing in terms of the message it sends kids. We now have people who are spending up to $50,000 a year to hire private admissions coaches who from the eighth grade on will help your child choose everything he or she does in a way that will supposedly maximize the chances that the com admissions committee at Dartmouth and Brown and Princeton will be impressed. We have essay writing camps that last four days but cost $14,000. When you enroll your kid in one of those, what's the message you're sending? that you can purchase any advantage that you want to, that money always does the talking. When you, when you choose every extracurricular activity for the way it's going to look, when you invent charity work for the way that's going to seem, when you treat these as little ribbons and bows, as opposed to substance, what does that say? Well, here's what Lloyd Thacker, who's the executive director of uh, the Education Conservancy, said to me about all of that. The message a kid hears is, I can't do it on my own. I'm not worth enough. Here's the way that um, Andre Phillips, a recruiter for the University of Wisconsin, described the message that kids get. We've spent so much time talking about packaging that it suggests that the real trick of the collegiate endeavor is to be packaged. I want to digress here and tell you about something that just made me crack up when I saw it as I was doing my research for the book. I was, I was bopping around a lot of the websites of the premier expensive college consulting firms, the ones that charge a lot of money to help guide your kid through all of it. And I was on the site for something called College Prep 360, run by a very lovely woman named Joey uh, Jaeger hyman And I clicked on the testimonials area. And there was one from a mother who said, without Joey, my son would never have gotten in early at Yale. And it was signed, a proud mother. And I thought, whoa, irony alert. You're proud <laughs> that you hired someone who by your testimonial made all the difference? Where was your son in that equation? Are we telling kids, are we telling a generation of kids um, or rather, are we instilling in them a heightened status consciousness with all of this attention to this school being better than this school being better than this school? Something else I saw at Princeton that made me wonder that and that speaks to that. There's an eating club there whose big party every year, the one that is the most beer-soaked, which people get the drunkest, is called State Night. And the reason is it's when you party as if you were at a state school. It gets worse. 
The required or the recommended wardrobe for this party is that you wear the t-shirt or sweatshirt from a state school. But some people come in, oh, an Amherst t-shirt or a UPenn sweatshirt, because it might as well be a state school. <laughs> I've been told that at certain Ivy League sporting events, the fans from one team will yell at the fans from the other, safety school. Are we telling these kids that access matters more than experience? I think that's the moral of what I observed in my Princeton class, and I think that's a dangerous message because experience in the end is gonna matter a whole lot more than access. Are we telling them that life, that all of life is a pecking order? That's what the state night party seems to say, and that's what seemed to be the reality for those Cornell students who were still smarting over the fact that they hadn't gotten in to Harvard or Yale. What really strikes me and what really confuses me is how many matters of common sense we throw out the window. How many things we know and we decide to entirely ignore when we decide that all of life is going to be decided by what a few elite schools say in the final days of March and in the first days of April. We know, for example, that different people flourish in different climates and that not everybody is going to hit their stride at the most competitive school. Um, many of you, obviously, because it's been referred to tonight, read the excerpt of my book that was in the Times, and so you know that someone from New Trier was mentioned, a young man named Peter Hart. And he will tell you that it was, it was because he went to Indiana University, instead of one of the more vaunted schools, that he realized how competent he was, that he found a confidence that he'd never found before, and that he hit his stride. The Ivy League might not have served him so well. He graduated from there into the kind of plum job that everyone at Harvard and Yale dreams of, um, and he is now completing business school, as I mentioned in that article, at Harvard. We know that people bloom at different stages of life, and that kids aren't necessary, not all kids are blooming during the sophomore, junior, or senior year of high school. One of my favorite examples of that and my favorite stories in the book is of a young man who went to a private school in Birmingham, Alabama, where he was completely undistinguished. He had a 2.9 GPA, um, didn't do particularly well on the SATs. In fact, interestingly, given his fate, um, he did much worse on the language SATs, the Eng English SATs, I forget what we call them now, then on the math. Um, he didn't even think about applying to truly, truly selective schools. He went to Kenyon, but in an era when, by his recollection, Kenyon accepted 50, 5-0% of its applicants. And even at Kenyon, he didn't hit his stride right away. He was interested in creative writing, or he thought he was. He took a creative writing class. When he applied to take the next class at the next level, even though there were only 20 comers for 16 spots, he didn't make the cut. He was told, based on the work he'd done to date, that he simply wasn't good enough. And he might have taken the message from that that he wasn't very good and that this wasn't going to be the thing he would do. That young gentleman's name is John Green. He's the author of The Fault in Our Stars. <laughs> We know that life doesn't follow a perfect script, and yet we're asking all of these kids to execute a perfect script to get from A to B to C as if it's all gonna just happen in that order and there's not gonna be any curveballs or serendipity. And yet life is all about curveballs and serendipity and setbacks and resilience. Um, in the book, I profile and was fortunate enough to get a long interview with Condoleezza Rice. Um, and she recalled that she was supposed to be a music major at the University of Denver. She went to the University of Denver because that's where she and her parents lived. They didn't want her far from home. And her choices were Colorado College or the University of Denver. Her father worked at the University of Denver, so she got a financial break there, so the University of Denver it was. That was as much thought as was put into the whole thing. She went there, she started out studying music, and she learned that she wasn't nearly as good as she thought she was. And so as she cast it around for a, new, for a new direction, a new option, she happened to take an international relations course and she happened to like it a whole lot. She now teaches at Stanford and she said to me, my students will come in and say, how do I do what you do? Which means they want to be Secretary of State. I say, so here's how you do it. You start as a failed piano major. <laughs> They're stunned. 
But what I'm trying to get them to see is that you have some time to recognize that special combination of what you love and what you're also good at. Taking the time to do that is very important. I ask you, are we giving kids the time to do that? We also need to broaden our conversation about how you choose a college. And we have to get people away from just choosing colleges based on which one is the most prestigious, as if prestige is an objective thing and not a subjective thing. Maybe the way to choose college is to look at which one will really upend and broaden your world. Howard Schultz, the CEO, president, and chairman of Starbucks, uh, went to high school in Brooklyn um, and didn't know how he was going to pay for college. Uh, and then a football coach at Northern Michigan University saw him play and offered him a scholarship. So he went there. Many of the kids he met, he'd never been out of the state of New York before his visit to that school. Many of the kids he met there had never met a Jewish person before. He'd never met anyone one who came from a farm. He will tell you that learning to adapt to that completely different environment, learning how to interact with people with whom he had no common history, made him a much nimbler person socially. It gave him leadership and interpersonal skills he never had, and that that has as much to do with where he ended up as any Ivy League school might have had for somebody else. Maybe we should encourage kids to choose college based on how it will fill in the blanks of their lives and how it will complete them, to use that phrase from Jerry Maguire. Um, a young gentleman I talked to really impressed me. His name is David Rusenko. His name is David Rusenko. He's 29 now. He told me about his path to college. He went to a tiny school in Morocco, because that's where his parents lived at the time. And it was an English language school. And there were all of 12 students, 12 seniors, in his graduating class. He applied to a number of schools, and the end of the day, the choice came down to Carnegie Mellon and Penn State. And he knew full well that Carnegie Mellon was an elite school, Penn State less so. But he was a computer nerd, and he felt like he had the computer nerd aspect of his life covered. And in his estimation, he would meet too many asocial computer nerds like himself at Carnegie Mellon. He thought that he might want, at some point in his life, to start a tech venture. And he thought, if I'm going to start a company, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to be able to lead people. I'm going to be able have, I'm going to have to be able to be socially nimble enough to rally people around me. I'm going to have to be able to project and communicate communicate well enough to get investors. And so he thought, you know, I think the thing for me is to go to Penn State, to make it a point to go to fraternity parties, to make it a point to go to football games, to really tug myself out of my tendencies and out of my comfort zone. And in that way, I'll become larger and I'll fill in those blanks. He graduated in 2006, and that was the same year that he and two of his classmates began a tech venture called Weebly, which is a service that helps you build your own websites. Weebly has grown and grown, and last year it was valued at $450 million. He now lives high on the hog in the tech utopia of San Francisco. We could decide to tell kids to factor into their choice of colleges the diversity of those colleges. We all know that a whole lot of this country's future hinges on how well we all manage diversity. And we all know that in any number of walks of life, you are going to be more comfortable, you're going to be more successful if you are comfortable with diversity. I know very few students who look at that. They can. Just last year, at the end of last year, and I'm proud to say, say that this happened by the New York Times, the Times put together something called um, the College Access Index, in which it tried to measure which of the well-known schools did the best job of really trying to build socioeconomic diversity into its student body. They looked at Pell Grant recipients, how many students were Pell Grant recipients. They looked at how much aid the colleges were giving out. And some of these names would, are familiar, but some are not. These were the top schools by, those measure, by that measure. Number one, Vassar. Number two, Grinnell. Number three, my alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill. Number four, Smith. Number five, a tie between Amherst and Harvard. 
I don't think many parents or students look at that list now available, and I wish they would. And I wish they would not just in a kumbaya way, but let me quote Catherine Bond Hill, who's the president of Vassar, the school that was in the number one position. If our students are going to make successful contributions to the future well-being of our society, they need to understand how to deal with diversity, and college campuses are a perfect place, an important place to learn that. She went on to stress that she was talking not just about a political value, but a practical value. I think that just about anything you're going to go on to do for the rest of your life, be a lawyer, be a doctor, or a teacher, you're going to be dealing with people very different from the kids you've gone to high school with. And understanding that and them is going to make you more successful as you go forward. I agree with her. And if you agree with that, you should look at the rankings done not just by US News and World Report, but the rankings done by Washington Monthly, which takes this sort of thing into account. You can, in fact, find relevant information on the US News, News and World Report website because they do an amazing job of collecting all sorts of stuff that they then just throw out the window when they're figuring out a how, to, how to rate a given college. So US News will tell you for every school what percentage of its students receive Pell Grants. US News will tell you something fascinating that I would, if I were doing it all over again, factor into my college choice. They'll tell you what percentage of the students at a given college at some point during their years at that college go abroad for at least a semester to study. Well, I think that's fascinating because who wouldn't want to be at a college where more students were coming back from abroad with those stories, with that perspective, and who wouldn't want to be at a college whose students were at least intellectually curious enough to want to go abroad to study? So I think we should talk in ways different than we do about how to choose college, and I definitely think we should talk a whole lot more than we do about how to use college. Because I think, when I look at successful people, I see no single pattern in terms of where they went to school, but with almost every one of them, I see a chapter of life, the college chapter, very, very well spent. Um, there's an interesting ongoing project that began just a little over a year ago called the Gallup Purdue Index. It's jointly sponsored by, it's, it's jointly run by the Gallup Polling Organization and by Purdue University, and it's an attempt to figure out what makes a college experience meaningful. They have tens of thousands of interviews going into this of college graduates of all different kinds of schools who've been out in life for all different spans of time. Um, and they try to gauge how professionally fulfilled these people feel and how happy and content they feel in the rest of their lives. They have found no difference between the graduates of schools that rank in the top 100 in US News and World Report and graduates of schools that did not rank in that top 100. Where they found a big difference in how well people were doing or at least felt they were doing later in life was how engaged those people were during their college years. Did they do a meaningful internship away from or adjacent to campus? Were they deeply involved in a student organization? Did they do a major thesis or research project? If they did, they tended to have, by their own estimations, a much brighter future than if they didn't. But it wasn't about the name of the school they went to. It was about the quality of the time they spent there. We don't even talk to kids about how to use college in some smaller and interesting ways. Here's something else Condoleezza Rice said to me. I tell students, if you're taking a class and you see a faculty member that you're interested in, read something the faculty member's written, then go see them. Faculty are vain. They'll love that, and then they'll remember you. No matter what university you're in, you'll find this across the board. I've had friends who've taught at San Diego State and at Hamilton College. Across the board, the student who shows initiative in a way that captures the imagination of that faculty member is going to get more time. My favorite example of someone who used college really, really well and who I think found a whole lot of the values that we should be celebrating in this process and beyond it is a young woman named Jillian Vogel. Um, and I want to read you the passage of my book that I wrote about her, and so that I get this right, I am going to put these on. Brown University had been Jillian's dream, and it hadn't seemed to her like such an impossible one, given that she was in the top five of roughly 100 seniors at a selective, well-regarded public school in New York City. 
She applied to Brown for early admission, was deferred, and had a good guess why, because her guidance counselor and others around her had warned her about the problem. She'd scored only 24 out of 36 on the ACT. After Brown deferred her, she resolved to charm the gatekeepers there into accepting her during the general admission period in the spring. She drew and sent them a comic strip of all the stuff she'd been up to since she first applied. She wrote and mailed them a letter which she addressed to that cursed 24 on the ACT. Dear Composite Score, it read, it has come to my attention that you are unimpressive. While you represent the hours in a day, the title of a television drama, and the product of three times eight, you are not an ideal ACT score. I have only a hazy memory of the Saturday morning of your conception, as it was so long ago. I could not foresee what you would represent and the amount of power you would come to hold over me. At the bottom of the letter, Jillian had a dozen of her teachers sign their names in support. And she wrote, that's 12 signatures to compensate for the 12 points between her 24 and a perfect 36. Astonishingly to me, Brown did not admit Jillian during the spring period. Nor did Middlebury, nor did Tufts, nor did Emery. She told me I felt so rejected. But she decided to turn that sting into resolve. And when she began college at her sixth or seventh or eighth choice school, she couldn't remember which it was, and it wasn't a bad one, it was UNC Chapel Hill, she sought the most interesting classes that she could find, and she wheedled or stormed her way into them. One of the most beloved seminars in the English department with just 12 to 15 students per session was an exploration of style and usage called Gram-O-Rama. It was reserved supposedly for kids on a creative writing track. Jillian wasn't on a creative writing track, but she had met the professor, she pleaded with the professor, and the professor finally let her in. She also managed to get into a word-of-mouth class about food science and food culture that included weekly dinners at the professor's house and an end of semester trip to the San Francisco Bay Area to eat in famed restaurants and visit a Napa Valley winery. This class was limited to 15 students in the honors program and Jillian wasn't in the honors program. But she thought, I'm going to write a long, thoughtful essay about growing up kosher and give it to the professor. He read it and he let her into the class. She said that if she wanted an exhilarating experience or an academic challenge at UNC, I could find it. It just took a little more effort. And she carried that gumption back to New York with her, pressing it into the service of a job hunt that led, ultimately, to exactly the kind of thing she wanted, a position recruiting and developing talent for an online entertainment company called College Humor Media. Jillian's gumption and her resilience are clearly going to matter more to her destiny than the name of the school on her diploma. The best that any college was going to do for her was to draw on that gumption and to give it even more muscle. UNC accomplished that and reaffirmed for her that you have more options than you initially think you do if you hunt for and insist on them. In fact, at UNC, she discovered and took advantage of something most students there are oblivious to. It's something I was certainly oblivious to when I was a student there. If there's a course at nearby Duke University that fits into what you're studying and isn't replicated at UNC, you can make arrangements, space permitting, to take that course. She did that for a lecture class on contemporary documentary filmmaking, um, contemporary documentary filmmaking that featured guest lectures by many renowned documentarians. But she was shocked, she told me, by how many of the Duke students in that class didn't even pay much attention to these guest lecturers. She told me, everybody in the classroom had their computers on and Facebook up, and it was like, what are you guys doing? That person is talking to you. Jillian said she got the feeling that Duke students had become accustomed, even numb, to the kinds of special opportunities that UNC students appreciated more. She said, maybe I'm just seeing what I wanted to see, but I'd sit there and I'd think, don't take this for granted, guys. In a weird way, I think we've all begun to take college for granted, or at least we've begun to frame it in so many wrong ways that we've lost sense of what it really represents and of its magic. 
I remember, I'm something of a dinosaur, I go back far enough that when I was getting ready to apply for college, um, it was on an electric typewriter, there was no common app, there was no cut and paste, I remember using Whiteout, do you remember Whiteout? <laughs> Wouldn't you hate to have put a lot of, owned a lot of stock in Whiteout? You'd really like, it wasn't going to pan out. Um, but, here, but I also remember this. When you heard the phrase, going to college, it had an electricity to it. It was exciting. And I think we've taken that phrase, going to college, and we've turned it into something that's fearful, that's anxiety-ridden, that gets people down instead of lifting them up. And I really think we need to ask ourselves if that's what we intend to do, and if we're doing anybody, kids, ourselves, our society, any favor with that. Um, I want to leave you with um, one last thing, because then I really do want to take any and all questions you have, and I'll stand here for as long as you'll have me. But I want to leave you with this last, last thing I tripped across when I was doing the book. Um, sometimes you get little gifts from God. They just drop out of the sky. And just before I handed in the book, I noticed a story in the Washington Post that was a profile of the gentleman who puts together those lovely US News and World Report rankings that Ted mentioned um, so admiringly, and that I've mentioned so admiringly from the podium tonight. His name is Bob Morse, and the reporter from the Washington Post had the very good sense to ask him at some point during the interview what he thought the relevance of a college's reputation to a student's future was. This is what Bob Morse, architect and caretaker of those US News rankings said. It's not where you went to school, it's how hard you work. And I'll tell you this, Bob Morse got his undergraduate degree at the University of Cincinnati, and he went to business school at Michigan State. Thanks.